thank you for having me here this afternoon or this morning. And I appreciate the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the present and future of the Embedded Ethics Program at Stanford University. My name is Maron Sahami. I'm the chair of the Computer Science Department at Stanford. And to tell you a little bit about what our goal is, I think of three goals that we have at the high level. The first one is to make ethics inescapable for students in computing. The idea being that all students who study computing need to understand something about the ethical implications of the work that they're doing. Second is to normalize the consideration of ethical and societal issues in the work of computing. And what I mean by that is that engineers and computer scientists need to think about ethics and the societal impact of their work as part of an engineering education. And ultimately, our goal is to evolve the process of software development so we can think about in the future how artificial intelligence and software in general is built that actually has these kind of ethical and societal considerations from the outset of when it's being built. With that in mind, we take a three-pronged approach. So there's three main pillars to teaching ethics at Stanford. And I'll talk briefly about two of them and spend most of the time talking about embedded ethics. So the first is to incentivize computer science students to take more multidisciplinary courses. As James talked about and as was alluded to yesterday, the importance of thinking outside the field of engineering as to bringing information from those fields to think about how to solve problems in engineering is critical for students thinking about the ethical implications of their work. Second is considering multidisciplinary courses that bring ethics and societal impacts of computer science directly to the fore as part of an education for computer science students. And the third is the embedded ethics program, which is to take ethical considerations and embed them into existing technical courses across a wide swath of the entire discipline. In this way, there's many different ways that ethics impact students' education, and they come out of a program realizing that ethical and societal considerations are integral parts of a computing or engineering education. So to talk a little bit about multidisciplinary courses, as James just alluded to, thanks very much, in the previous talk, the importance of having teams from across different disciplines work together to solve problems is critical. And in doing that, when we think about multidisciplinary courses, what we want to do is encourage students, and we currently do this in our program, and was alluded to yesterday, same sort of directions that MIT is going in, to consider courses from humanities and social sciences that actually are part of a computer science program. And here's a long list. I won't read through all of the class names, but you can see certain ideas that seem very outside traditionally of computer science. Things like courses in ethical theory, or thinking about race, gender, and literary digital humanities, are courses that we now count toward the computer science program, even though they're offered in different departments, to give students more of an idea of the ways that they can think about these fields impacting computing. And so these come from areas as diverse as anthropology, history, philosophy, English, um, American studies, which is essentially a form of history, a wide swath of departments from across the entire university that now count toward the computer science program. And this is actually, we've been doing this for several years now, and it's quite popular among students. The second thing to think about is multidisciplinary courses focused on ethics with technical issues all wrapped together. And so the last few years, we've been teaching a class called Ethics, Public Policy, and Technological Change that brings these different viewpoints together. It's taught by three different faculty, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. But one of the faculty comes from the world of philosophy. He's actually a philosopher by training and also has an appointment in the computer science or in the uh, political science department, Rob Reich, that um, uh, James just told you about, who had briefed President Biden, one of the co-instructors for this class. Another is Jeremy Weinstein, who actually worked in the White House in the United States during the Obama administration and is a professor of public policy and, computer, and, and political science who brings the policy aspects to it. 
And then a third professor, myself, who's a computer scientist who brings the technology aspect to the class. And the three of us worked in tandem to develop this course to bring all of these viewpoints together to show students why all of these viewpoints are important to thinking about the future of technology. And it's not just for computer science students. Part of the discussion is not just thinking about getting computer scientists to think about ethics, but to get people who are from the worlds of policy, political science, communications, anthropology, to think about computing so that we can speak the same language and really be able to communicate with each other. And so this course is actually also in the philosophy department, also in the political science department, also considered a public policy course to bring all these students together. And the way this course works in terms of structure is there's a number of themes in the class. And we can think about, say, the use of AI in algorithmic decision making, or thinking about issues of data privacy or the political economy. So there's lots of topics we think about in the class. And for each one of these topics, what we do is we present multiple viewpoints for each theme. So we provide a philosophical perspective. What are the values at stake when we think about privacy? Why does privacy even matter? And for some of the computer scientists in the room, they don't have a good answer to that question until we begin to think about what are the trade-offs when one has to consider questions of privacy. Then we present a technical perspective, which is a deep dive on the technology and what it provides. So in the case of privacy, we could talk about encryption. We talk about differential privacy. We talk about the technical ways that we might try to achieve the goals that we want and how that interplays with the trade-offs that we actually consider. So let me give you an example. In the case of end-to-end -end cryptography, so if you consider an application like WhatsApp, right, your messages are end-to-end -end encrypted. No one gets to see them except for the sender and the receiver. That's great. It ensures your privacy. It also ensures privacy for human traffickers and for terrorists. And so what we have there is a value trade-off that we need to consider. When we consider those issues, the issues don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a society, and we need to consider all of the societal aspects to come up with good solutions, both from a technological and a societal standpoint. And then we have a policy perspective, which are what are the rights and responsibilities of the stakeholders involved? What do private citizens have as rights for their privacy? What does the government try to ensure in terms of national security and potentially having a right to break encryption systems to understand what communications are happening? And so there's a deep, rich discussion that happens around all of these viewpoints. And we don't just bring in the viewpoints from an academia. We actually bring in panels of practitioners, policymakers, and academics from other institutions to have a more robust conversation. When we talk about issues of privacy, for example, we bring in people from the National Security Agency. We bring in members of Congress to talk to our class about what are the considerations they think about. We bring in the CEO of Signal, the messaging app, to talk about why encryption is important to them from that perspective. So students can get a sense for how these issues are adjudicated in industry, in government, and in other locales. And ultimately, we think about a synthesis. How do we actually make these kind of value trade-offs? What are the contexts we consider, and how does the information fit together? So students can come away with a much more robust understanding of an issue than just, oh, privacy. I deal with that through encryption, which is the traditional technical answer by itself. The student feedback for the course has been tremendous. I'll just give you a few examples. Thinking about combining disciplines, as was alluded to, the importance of multidisciplinary teams, something the students themselves enjoy, they think it's a brilliant and new idea. Um, thinking about the interdisciplinary aspect of the class, one of the things I loved is a student saying, it forced me to think in new ways and discuss important ideas with people from other majors. Just that discussion alone opens the horizon of students to think about how do I consider these issues from other viewpoints, and ultimately to have an impact. I'm much more aware of and concerned about ethical concerns surrounding the rapid growth in the tech industry. Students tell us they make different decisions in their careers, in what they choose to work on, the problems they want to tackle, and how they address them as the result of seeing material like this. So it makes an actual difference. If we think about that class as just one class, since that time when we first started teaching that class, about seven years ago now, there has been a, just a blossoming of other classes that are specific to thinking about issues of ethics, society, and technology all wrapped together. This is just a sampling of the classes in these areas in the computer science department. 
Other uh, departments at the university have also created classes that bridge from their departments, say philosophy or political science, into the technological realm. So the university as a whole is moving more in this direction and it makes a big difference in students, not just in computing, but in other disciplines as well to be able to talk to computer scientists. So some of the issues here you can see clearly classes on ethics of artificial intelligence, or trustworthy machine learning, but we can even talk about issues of how do you bridge policy and technology through design, one of the topics that James alluded to earlier. So it spans a wide variety of topics and technologies. But what I really want to talk about is embedded ethics. This is one of the places where there is a secret sauce, although it's not so secret, to think about making computing inescapable for computer science students. When they're standalone classes, they can still choose to take them or not take them, although there is a, a school of engineering requirement that they have to take at least one, and most students take more than one. But Embedded ethics says, let's take our existing classes in computer science and put in modules on ethical issues so that students in the normal course of the technical classes they take are exposed to these issues again and again. And here's the basic idea. This project originated at Harvard under the leadership of Barbara Gross, and the idea was to create these modules that are embedded into existing topically relevant computer science classes. The idea here is that students get repeatedly exposed to these ethical discussions. So it's not just something they see once or in one class. It's something they see over and over, reinforcing the idea that these kind of ethical discussions are part of the training of a modern computer scientist. It's not something that comes after the fact. It's not something that gets bolted onto the side. It is intrinsic to their education as engineers. And I have to give very special thanks to Song Yi and the NC Foundation for making this possible. It's really your vision that's helped inspire this across a lot of universities. And to be completely honest, this would not exist without your support. So thank you. So what does this look like for us? What it looks like is something that's certainly taken on national or global prominence. Embedded ethics now exists at places including Stanford, MIT, Northeastern, and others. And it's a partnership across multiple parts of the university. So for us, there is the human-centered AI institute that James just talked about, Rob Reich, who's uh, one of the associate directors there, Ann Newman, who's the executive director of the Ethics Center, and myself from the computer science department and also an affiliation in HAI, all work together to be able to deliver this program because we want multiple parts of the university involved to make it successful. And to give you an idea of how far it's come in just a few years, there's already 15 computer science classes at Stanford that are taught by 22 different faculty that already contain embedded ethics modules and we continue to grow the program every year. So this is a large fraction of our entire department is working on these topics or has these topics in their classes and a large number of courses, including five of the six core courses that are required for all undergraduate computer science majors. So that means if you are an undergraduate computer science major at Stanford, you are guaranteed to see at least five different modules of embedded ethics alone. Most likely you're going to see a lot more, but these are the classes that are required for everyone. What that means in terms of practical uh, uh, downstream uh, impact is that every term at Stanford, we have three terms during the year, thousands of students are enrolled in courses with embedded ethics modules. So again, this is something that isn't just something they see on the side. It is ubiquitous across the computer science curriculum. And again, the focus being to train these students to really think about these ethical considerations as part of their educational process. Now, here is just a laundry list of some of the courses that are covered by uh, Embedded Ethics. I won't read all of their names, but to give you a sense of why this is important, we start with our very first class, Programming Methodology. That's an introductory programming course. It's taken by the majority of all undergraduates at Stanford, not just computer science majors, the entire university. So what does that mean? It means not only does the computer science student see embedded ethics, but everyone else, or almost everyone else at the university, at this point it's about 80% of the university takes that class, sees the computer scientist as part of their training get issues of ethics. So what it does is it not only heightens computer scientist sensitivity to think about ethics, but gets other people to understand that this is a topic that computer scientists also care about so that they can build bridges going forward. 
And so this comes up then in our second class, programming abstractions, and there's a whole litany of classes, including ones you might not have considered. For example, probability for computer scientists or operating systems all have ethical issues embedded in them, whether it be how you trust the computer system, whether or not it can leak information, how we think about probability relative to the distribution of different effects of artificial intelligence on people, all of these classes have robust considerations of ethical issues as a result of these modules that have been developed inside them. And then clearly in more advanced classes like artificial intelligence or natural language processing, places where we would normally expect to see many ethical issues arise also have uh, these modules on embedded ethics. So across a wide variety of the curriculum, again, including five of the six courses that are required for all undergraduate majors. If you're wondering what the sixth one is, by the way, it's a discrete math class. A little more tricky to get uh, and bet ethics issues there, but we're working on it. We'll get there eventually. Um, so what are the module goals? The goals are to both think about issues of content, issues like bias and fairness, inequality, privacy, and trust, the kinds of things we might think of have large societal implications, combined with the ethical skills to think about how does someone recognize the issues, how do they become sensitized to those issues, how do they develop a language to talk about moral choices, and to be able to do that across disciplines. And the ultimate goal is to have professional responsibilities that computer scientists consider for themselves whether they go out into roles as software engineers, executives at tech companies, or move into areas like politics, which I'll actually give you an example of in just a bit. So we want to give a wide uh, uh, area for discussion and language development when we think about these issues. So what's the process look like? Again, part of the key here is multidisciplinary teams. This is critical to what we do. So for every course, for every module, there's an embedded ethics postdoctoral fellow who generally has a background in either computer science or philosophy. Kathleen Creel, who's here, was one of our very first postdocs doing this and helped really set the imprint for what the program looks like. And amazingly enough, she has a background in both computer science and philosophy, which we were delighted by to have her work with us. There's an ethics teaching assistant who's a computer science graduate student, and then there's also the faculty instructor. And so what you get is backgrounds in areas like philosophy or history of science to bring a deep ethical understanding to developing a module, a computer scientist who comes along and says, here are the technical details so when we create an assignment or we create lectures for the students to see, this isn't just separate content. This is integrated well into the technical content that they're seeing. There's something really meaty here. And the faculty instructor who wants to know what's going on, and actually, to be honest, in many cases, is learning something themselves about the ethical issues of the material they're teaching. And so the process starts before the quarter even starts to think about what are the shared learning objectives and start planning. Um, there's meetings with the instructor and the fellows to really get um, an understanding of what should be taught in that course, what the module is going to be. Regular check-ins as it goes on. And the postdoctoral fellow creates lecture materials and works with the ethics teaching assistant to develop the assignment as we talked about so there's deep integration in the class. Student learning often happens by doing assignments. As much as I like to say, or I think, I'm a professor, I stand in front of a room, I talk to people, they learn. The real learning isn't by me talking. The real learning is by them doing. And that's why part of the critical aspect of embedded ethics is for them not just to hear things, but is to actually grapple with it and do the work and understand why these issues are hard, have discussions as a result, and be able to convey to someone else what are the things they learned as a result of doing these kinds of things. So it's actual, the hands-on work is really critical to this. What does this look like? Let me give you a couple examples. So 106A is our very first programming course. It's an introductory programming course. Assumes no previous background in computing. But by the end of the class, we have the students do a program called Infinite Story that actually is writing a program that integrates with ChatGPT, if you can believe it. They do that in the first class. So what is Infinite Story? If you remember these books when we were kids, these choose your own adventure books where you read and you make a choice as to what is the character gonna do when you go to another page, that's what this is in a computer program. But the reason why it's infinite is because the computer doesn't start with the whole story. It starts with the background and when you get to a part of the story that hasn't been completed, 
the program calls ChatGPT to say complete or give me the next step in the story. First class students do this. So the question is when we have them do this integration, right, they're actually working with a powerful AI model. We give them an, an actual key to be able to, to communicate with the real chat GPT. It's not just the toy in house. Then we ask them questions. We say, we're going to give you lots of different starting points for the story. One of the story starting points we're going to give you is about software engineers. See what chat GPT generates. What are the genders of those software engineers? What are the names of those software engineers? What countries do they look like they come from? When you ask for images of those software engineers, who are the people that are represented? And the idea here is then to ask them, how comfortable do you feel letting an AI model actually decide the names of the story? Would you trust a model to do this? And it gets them to begin to think more critically about the results that are generated by the model because it's their program that's now presenting those results to the user. And ultimately, we think about, well, if you consider these are the kinds of things the chat GPT gets used for, how would you feel if it was you were not just generating a story, but you were asking the system to, say, evaluate job candidates? So then we take it from this little problem of generating a story, which is kind of fun, and turn it into a real societal question, where they can take the ideas that they got from looking at the names and the faces from the stories they generated and understand what that actually means when high stakes decisions like employment are actually being made. This is in the very first class. We do this 15 times during their education as computer scientists because we want to impress upon them how important these issues are by the time they graduate. So let me give you another example, operating systems. You might think operating systems, right? That's a class about lots of programming, you know, memory management. How do you think about ethics there? So the way we think about ethics is we say, what is the key to an operating system? The notion of trust. Where does that trust come from? So when you consider the notion of trust, do you have bugs in your operating system? How long do they exist? Do they leak data? Can they be hacked? How trustworthy is the operating system? Then we talk philosophically about what does trust even mean? Where do you get trust from, right? Not just as a technical concept, but as a philosophical concept. And then we move into issues to think about, say, trust across, we do a case study, and then we talk about trust across say, uh, shareholders. What does it actually mean when you're building an operating system and you're using a library built by someone else? Do you trust that library? What gives you trust in the library? And we talk about a vulnerability called meltdown, which actually resulted from third party libraries that were being used in a hardware system, sort of a, a hardware bug, to show students the notion of trust as something that extends just beyond the code you write, but in terms of systems integration work. And then it becomes real and grounded in what it means to build an operating system or a large piece of software where you have to think about what's trustworthy, what's leakable, what has errors, what does that mean in terms of information that might be compromised for other people. I'll give you one last example. So algorithms, traditional class you might think about, advanced algorithms class for our undergraduates. And so the example we talk about here is notions of equity, disparate treatment, and impact. So we say, imagine you're an online retailer. What you want to do is you want to use a graph algorithm to optimize the routes for your trucks to do delivery. Set your objective function to optimize the delivery routes to maximize revenue. What does that mean for economically disadvantaged neighborhoods? What it means is your trucks don't go there. Those people don't have the same opportunities that the affluent neighborhoods have where the trucks go constantly and there's either higher rates of delivery or cheaper amounts of delivery. That's based on looking at the practical societal consequences of setting a function in an optimization algorithm. And then we say, OK, modify that objective function to consider delivery routes optimized for equal access. And now consider the value trade-offs involved. Who are you serving versus how much revenue are you generating? These are real questions that real companies ask, and they're things we want students to grapple with before they're confronted in making those decisions without any training out in the real world. So we've done some evaluations to get a notion of how do students view what the, the courses that we're giving them. This is some very preliminary data, but to give you a sense of when we ask them questions like, when I look at the ethical content of this course, it prompted me to think about issues of ethics more often. You can see this is the 50% line. This is kind of the real red is not at all. The green, the deep green, is a lot. 
and for the vast majority of students, it prompts them to think more about these issues or improve their understanding of ethical practice or to consider the societal implications of their work. There's still more work for us to do. Ultimately, what we'd like to see is this whole bar be deep green. But we're working on it to move further and further along. And this is actually preliminary data. This, is, come, this data comes from students that often only had maybe just one or two of the embedded ethics modules, not the full set of stuff that we actually deliver today. We actually have an ongoing study, but we haven't collected all the data yet, so I can't give you the more recent results. So what does this mean in terms of broadening out? Well, last year we held a national conference on embedded ethics at Stanford. Um, again, once again, thanks to the support of the NC Foundation, Young um, a uh, 140 instructors from diverse institutions came. There were a number of keynotes and invited speakers, including Barbara Gross, who was one of the founders of Embedded Ethics at Harvard. Um, we also had Mariana Florentino Cuellar, who's the president of the Carnegie Endowment come, as well as Nikki Washington, a professor from Duke. There were a number of panels involved where we talked about how do you get institutional buy-in? How do you make something like this work at your university? And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But how you st structure successful programs, and then we also uh, shared resources. So there's a website, embeddedethics.stanford.edu. If you go there right now, you might actually get a certificate warning, because we just had a certificate expire while I was on the plane flying out here. It's, it's in the process of being corrected. It will be uh, available, but we make our uh, materials for the different classes available on the site for easy adoption by other people. So how do you get buy-in? How do you make this work at your own institution? One of the things that's critical is getting the faculty to buy in. And one of the things people often say is when they want to start is, how do I get everyone on board with this? How do I convince the people, especially the people who don't agree that ethics should be part of computing? And the simple answer is, you don't. You start with the people who do agree. You don't need to get your whole department to agree to begin to do this. All you need is a few people who actually care and understand about these issues to be the place to start. And that's exactly what we did. Then you think about the fact that computing is a narrative that's being written no matter what we do as faculty. So if we don't do anything, the narrative around the ethics of computing will be written for us by other people. If we want to write that narrative ourselves, we have to get into the game and help write that narrative by making that part of the educational process. You get the word out, faculty meetings, emails, you bring this repeatedly to the attention of your faculty. So then those people who said, no, this idea never works, start hearing from their colleagues that it works. They start hearing from students about how they saw this material in their classes and it's actually influencing their thinking. And so they make changes in their own thinking, not because you tell them, right? It's not a tell thing, it's a show thing. You actually show that it works and people's opinions change. And you make it easy to get involved. So when someone finally flips that switch and says, okay, how do I do this? You make it easy by limiting the amount of work the instructor needs to do, and that's where the postdoctoral fellows come in who actually do a lot of the heavy lifting to incorporate these modules into the classes. And I, you know, as department chair or even as associate chair before, when we were doing this, when we first started, we'd highlight faculty who were doing this work. We'd essentially try to show their colleagues that there's people who are actually getting involved and in thinking about the kind of credit that we could sort of give at least through acknowledgement to other faculty. And it creates an expectation of involvement. It says, hey, guess what? more and more of your colleagues are actually doing this work. And so when we would put out calls now to get more faculty involved with embedded ethics, we actually have more demand than we have uh, uh, postdoctoral fellows right now to help with. So we actually have a backlog in the pipeline of adding these modules. So we've actually moved from a place of trying to push it out to people to just you know being able to absorb all the demand. And there's a lot of resonance with the younger faculty who understand the importance of ethical implications of computing. It's also important to get buy-in from the students, and this is critical. We don't think of this endeavor as something that's for our department or for our faculty. First and foremost, we think of this endeavor for our students. And that's an important thing to keep in mind because oftentimes institutional decisions are made for the faculty, not for the students. And so we think about having them be part of the narrative for why we need to do this, right? Having them understand that they're helping write the story of computer science as well 
And that story could turn out badly if we don't think about these issues properly. Extending the narrative through student groups, there's a CS plus social good group on campus. Students listen to other students. That in some sense is even more powerful than what they hear from their faculty about the classes they should take. It's what they hear from each other about what was neat to take, what changed their thinking, what was cool. We get feedback from them. We talk with students, we survey what resonates with them, what doesn't work, we update the materials as a result. We don't have a belief that, oh, the first time we do it, it's perfect. In many of the classes, we've had a module, we've changed it over time or completely pulled it out and put, replaced it with an entirely new module based on feedback we get from students and also from the instructors from the, the course. And perhaps most importantly is you need institutional partners. And when I think about institutional partners, it's working across different academic silos. Traditionally, we think about just departments, but getting different departments or units or institutes at the university to work together and then thinking about bringing in chairs, deans, presidents of the university all the way up. This has actually made a big difference for us. And the important thing to remember is no one wants to say we shouldn't teach ethics, right? If you go and talk to the president of your university and say we should teach ethics, they don't say no, that's not important, <laughs> right? They want to do this. They just may not necessarily know how. And so if you come to them with a game plan to say, you know what, we're gonna make you look good because we're gonna teach the stuff that people actually care about, but we need your help to do it, they get on board with this. And so it's a win-win for everyone. So up all the way up to the president of our university, we've had support for the work that we've doing and help publicizing it. And the important thing is to think about sustainability. You always need to be planning for the future and thinking about maintenance. This is not a one and done kind of thing where you just build it and then you're done. You always think about how do you update it, how do you make it better to keep it fresh for the students. So our long-term ambition, just to wrap up quickly, is to cultivate and support this ethic of responsibility among technologists, to really build institutional connections across all of Stanford. But most importantly, that last point I left you with is to lay a groundwork for what we think of as the fourth level of consideration in the future of software development. Now, what do I mean by the fourth level of consideration? Let me give you a little historical tour. Back in the early days of software development in the 60s and 70s, people built software and they realized we need to test software. So what they did was they built quality assurance teams that when a product gets built, tests it. And so no serious software company does not have a quality assurance team. What happened a few years later, they realized in the 80s, usability and user testing made a huge difference. We got graphical user interfaces. We got the notion of icons. We got the notions of using a mouse to interact with a computer. And now all serious software houses think about the notion of user usability and user testing. Around the time the internet exploded, security audits and red teaming became standard practice to maintain the security of software because that was delivered over the web and it was much more vulnerable, especially with user data. Those are the first three generations of software development. The goal we aspire to is the fourth generation, which is considering ethical and social considerations in the development of software as an integral part of the software development process. Not something that gets bolted on afterwards, but something that is a first class notion of improvement, the same way clearly assurance, user testing, and security audits are for software now. That's what we try to instill in our students through our, through our education. That's where we hope we can advance the field to. So thank you very much. Um, there's lots of things we could think about for the future, um, but really our plan is to continue to increase the number of computer science, the number of embedded ethics modules in computer science. And with that, I will thank you and wrap up.